Welcome CUBE community to Modern Devices for Modern Cyber Threats. I'm Jackie McGuire, your practice lead and principal analyst for security. And we're here today to talk about how to make your fleet a strong first line of defense for cyber threats in the modern AI era. I am lucky enough to be joined by two experts in this area. Uh, from Dell, I would like to welcome Rick Martinez. He's a fellow and vice president for the office of the CTO. And from AMD, I'd like to welcome J.R. Balaji. He's the Director of Software Product Management at AMD. Rick, J.R., welcome. And thanks for having us. Yeah, great to be here. All right, I wanna kind of take a step back and set the stage and some context for what we're going to talk about today. So um, we were talking before we started this interview today and over the last kind of decade, Software has really been one of the more limiting factors in technology. So we've made incremental improvements in PCs, in things like processor speed and you know multi-threading and things like that. But really the software that we have has been somewhat of a limiting factor. And now if we think about AI and how it's changed things over the last couple of years and will change things going into the future, your endpoint and your hardware has now become somewhat of the limiting factor. So if we think about some of the leaps in, we've made, for example, in generative AI, a lot of that has been powered by smarter smartphones and more powerful endpoints. And so we have this huge wave of millions of PCs that were bought during the pandemic, um, personal and corporate enterprise PCs, and those are all coming up for refresh over the next couple of years. And so we'd like to kind of give people some some tips and some thoughts to keep top of mind as they're refreshing these PCs, because what you would have bought five years ago is not going to work today. And for a lot of the things you're actually gonna to need to start doing at the end point, that requires a much different investment in equipment that we've seen before. Um, so J.I., I kinda of wanna start with you. I wanna start but all the way down at the processor level of the endpoint. And I want to talk about how AMD thinks about security at the processor level. Sure. Uh, I want to begin by saying that, um, you know, traditionally customers did their, as you rightly said, customers did their refreshes based on, hey, do I have more processing capacity, better RAM, better hard disk, because my applications are larger, my processing and uh, workloads are slightly, you know, uh, more demanding. That's kind of how they went about, right? Um, the next wave of uh, silicon level improvement that we're looking at at AMD is really preparing the end user device to be ready for the for the AI era, right? AI era is already here, right? We all have, we all have living we are all living through that. Uh, that means a couple of things, right? First and foremost, um, in the last I would say a decade or so, a lot of the security improvements were done at the uh, at the software layer, right? Hey, software layer, it's all cloud based software. To identify threats at that layer and then you try to prevent them, right? Uh, as the computing landscape shifts and, and we all have heard about just how demanding the AI workloads are going to be, right? So not everything can be physically done at the data center layer, right? Inferencing and all of that, it's going to require a tremendous amount of data center capacity build out and power requirements and we read about it all the time. Uh, it's going to have to take a lot, some of that you know, valuable computing to shift to the endpoints because it can be done more efficiently, it can be done more securely, it can be done with a smaller blast radius and so on and so forth. In order to do that, two things are required. You need to obviously have the computing engines within the, the silicon to be better equipped to handle the AIML workloads. That's how the emergence of the neural processing units, the MPU as we call them, have come in. But along with that, as we think about it, as your digital landscape shifts and changes, your cybersecurity had to pretty much be carried along with it. And, and as a result of that, we are thinking about how do we create uh, trusted execution environments within the silicon such that when you run AI workloads, you know, you're know you not like, they're not left up to easy way of our attackers to steal the models or reverse engineer or do data parts. So we think about that a lot as we build the next generation of uh, AMD silicon. Great. Yeah. And I think, you know, we may not always comprehend the velocity at which AI powered threats really come at you. And, you know, we've seen in some of Anthropic and a handful of different recent security reports around AI that attackers are now starting to use AI agents against the enterprises that they're compromising. So Rick, I'd like to turn to you and talk about um, from the processor level up to the endpoint level, um, how do Dell and AMD partner together to expand that security from kind of 
the processor to the general endpoint. Sure. Well, as JRB mentioned, you know, AMD's provided a great security foundation. Uh, one of my jobs uh, from the Office of CTO is to kind of predict the future. And from a security perspective, that's always been predicting the future of our adversaries and our threats, you know, our threat actors. Uh, but moving forward and much more recently, it's predicting the future of, of kind of these really rapidly evolving use cases and AI at the endpoint is one of them, right? So we think about, um, we do high level threat modeling uh, based on um, adversarial activity, based on the evolution of AI capabilities, both from an attack and a defense perspective, but also as you, as you mentioned, right? Um, doing that threat modeling, performing that threat modeling and making investments uh, above the hardware, uh, from the firmware drivers all the way up to the operating system, um, we do that based on you know what the what the customer is going to be using the PC for, and and uh, more and more in the future, as you mentioned, that's going to be AI workloads on the PC, and that's that's great, um, and it's not only making that uh, making that foundation and that defense in depth, uh, you know, more. Um, resilient against attacks, but it's also making sure that we are still supporting uh, the performance and you know the capabilities that are needed um, for the AI future. Yeah, and Rick, maybe you can talk a little bit um, about how you know how things have changed and how you see them changing into the future as you work with Dell and the amazing amount of information they have because they have so many enterprises using their endpoints. You know how how have you really seen this evolution take place? And as you're thinking about, say, building the processor for 2030 or building the processor I'm going to buy today and still be able to use effectively, both for productivity and security in 2030, how do you think about that evolution? Yeah. So again, we have to we have to look uh, towards the future, perhaps sometimes even further along than our customers are looking. And you know, we we are certainly seeing the um, the movement of AI workloads and AI inferencing to the endpoint. And that means that we are responsible and, and we need to continue to invest in security at the endpoint to protect our customers' data. Um, so if you think about, um, you know, again, AI being used as a um, adversarial uh, tool, um, but also a very prominent use case for our customers, we kind of have to think about both in our threat modeling and uh, in our investment underneath the OS. And JR, you've talked about kind of three different types of actors, threat actors that you think about when you're thinking about protecting um, endpoints at the processor level. Can you talk a little bit about what those three different types of adversaries are and how you've seen their tactics evolve in the last few years? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to start by saying that, you know, cyber criminals have always been good at leveraging the latest and the best technology. And we've seen their tendency to, to even share their trade cast with their, with their peers, right? So that's why they're kicking all, our be... butts, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't they care are, about right? intellectual property. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it should, it should be no surprise that they, they would use AI to their advantage. In fact, the most recent, uh, 2025 CrowdStrike Global Threat Report highlighted that the three major category of adversaries, so nation states, they're, they're playing a very big role in cyber attacks these days. Uh, they used to be like small and a niche at one point in time. It's completely changed the landscape. And then you have e-crime syndicates and then you have hacktivists. And they all have become uh, early and avid adopters of AI tools. So easy access to LLMs. The LLMs are being more customized to be able to efficiently run on the endpoints. And that makes them, uh, you know, the ability to use those tools uh, at unprecedented scale. Uh, and I still think that we're still in early innings on all of this. Yeah, and I know we've seen a lot of activity in, in you know, in the news about AI uh, increasing the scale of phishing attacks and other things like that. But really, any traditional attack, you know, be it ransomware, malware, or even, you know, social engineering is, uh, you know, is, is, is given a boost by a lot of these uh, LLMs and and AI capabilities that the attackers have now. Yeah, and I would, yeah, I would in fact add that, you know, a couple of things, right? You can kind of look at them in two different lenses, right? One is just because adversaries now have access to AI, they can pretty much change the scale and pace of attacks and they can apply it in all aspects of cybersecurity, right? Of, of, of uh, cyber attack. Right? One is they can just create malware much faster. They can mutate them much faster. Still a lot of traditional signature-based antivirus is used uh, by customers. 
So it's very easy to evade them if you're constantly churning out these mutated malware and, and kind of distributing them. Or, you know, a few years ago, ransomware as a service used to be a thing. People used to go to the dark web, catch, out, catch word of somebody, have them create a ransomware file and then roll it out and share the spoils. Uh, now with wipe coding and all kinds of security and AI tools, uh, anyone with a bad intent can actually create their own variant of ransomware. Uh, or they can use it to predict uh, passwords at scale. Uh, the other common uh, exploitation that we foresee is um, really weaponizing CVEs, right? So somebody can go scout all the CVEs available, create a map of what is the most efficient way, which are the low hanging fruits of targeting, uh, and then go at it. Yeah, I think if you think about what recon and exploitation of a CVE looked like a couple years ago, it was, okay, first of all, the CVE has to relate to something in my environment. The attacker has to know it's in my environment. They have to know how to exploit it. They have to find it. That can all be done in milliseconds now, right? We can do full yeah. recon, a list of the CVEs that are applicable, a list of the firmware that's out of date. And so I think the, the velocity of the way threats are changing and the thing that used to protect you, which is that maybe a piece of firmware that's out of date is pretty hard to get to your environment in your environment is no longer going to protect you because it's a small piece. I always refer to AI as a magnet for all of the unfortunate needles in your haystack because anomalies are something that AI loves trying to find. So, all right, so we have a few minutes left and I think it's important now that we've educated people and thoroughly scared them about all of the threats that are out there, um, there are ways to protect yourself, right? And I think, you know, for me, AI is just as much a financial risk as it is a technology risk and that these agents are probably going to get expensive. It's probably going to require significantly more um, investment in things like observability and resiliency and, and all of those types of things. So I want to wrap it up by giving people some kind of practical, what should I be doing right now? And if I am at that point where I need to refresh a whole fleet of endpoints, what should I be thinking about? Um, JR, we can start with you um, and then Rick, you can bring us home. Yeah, I want to start by saying that software protecting software is good, but hardware protecting software is even better, right? which is where the hardware investments we make on the AMD side and then in partnership with Dell become very critical uh, because hardware in many ways, and we've already established in the, in the first few minutes of this discussion, is going to be foundational. Um, as AI evolves, you know, we're going to be having to look at, the things that customers should look for is that, uh, you know, you could have the best software layer, antivirus, anti-malware firewall, uh, all it takes for an adversary is an is a is a vulnerable firmware to get into the into the environment, right? So you want to make sure that you're protecting all layers of the ecosystem. More importantly, the foundational layers of the ecosystem, which is hardware, silicon, and, and hardware together. Um, so we look at things like um, like how do we how do you like the when you when you press the power button on a machine, it boots, right? There are people just see it booting, the bias screen is on, and then the OS comes up. And but there's so much goes on behind the screen. Uh, there's so many processes that are running, boot processes. Uh, any of them can be tampered with, right? So the investments we have made over the last several years in creating a silicon root of trust and then working in partnership with Dell to have this hardware root of trust ensures that all that boot process is clean and secure when it gets up up, up until it gets to the OS stage, right? And then on a regular basis, we want to make sure, you know, you know, attackers are constantly evolving. They steal mem uh, assist, uh, information off of the system memory. So we have put uh, uh, information called as memory guard, AMD memory guard, which is to ensure that all of the, mem the temporary information stored on the DRAM is also protected. And then all the other things like ability to have more complex uh, threat attacks like ROP attacks protector using shadow stack uh, AMD shadow stack, and of course, traditional methods like TPM, all of that is built to ensure that we have preventions in place and we also have countermeasures in place. Yeah, and I'll follow that up uh, with um, just the general overview from a security practitioner standpoint, uh, newer systems are gonna be more secure, right? We are constantly investing in security in our products along with AMD below the OS and above the OS. So, um, it, you know, uh, we we look forward to these big product uh, refresh cycles um, like the Win Windows 11 refresh cycle because that means that customers are going to be getting newer and more secure systems and and as always right security should be a key driver uh, when uh, 
in purchasing des decisions for these customers. Um, and, and really, you know, if I had a, you know, a couple of tips uh, for those customers looking to, um, you know, protect their assets is, is first, you know, identify your assets. Those are different now that um, we're in an AI world, right? Um, obviously, data is always going to be uh, an important asset, but models and the model pipeline and things like that are also equally important now. And that's, you know, those are things that we're thinking about as we build security into the foundations of the PC, too. Um, so, yeah, definitely uh, look at your your vendors, make sure you're working with secure suppliers and make sure that, um, you know, they're they're taking into account the new AI world into their threat, threat models like we do. And and. Um, uh, you know, uh, staff your fleet with with secure products. Yeah, and if I can also add, uh, Jackie, is that you know, you, they should also look at vendors that give them a greater and granular level of observability. Uh, will put customers in a better spot because you know, like you said, it's finding it's finding that needle in a haystack before it's exploited. Yeah, yeah, and I think everybody should keep in mind that as these workloads become heavier and heavier and more expensive to process in the cloud, the likelihood of uh, more hybrid computing is extremely high. So while you may be thinking, well, we built everything in the cloud and that's where it's all going to happen. I've been predicting for a couple of years that those costs are going to explode because everybody's trying to do everything and we can only build so many data centers. So um, you may think that your endpoint is not a big deal right now, but if you think into the next several years and your ability to continue to deliver and utilize AI and capacity, um, they're going to become increasingly important. I also want to give a shout out if you are in a wave of endpoint refresh, um, Dell has a phenomenal responsible recovery and recycling program where enterprises can ship their old devices back and actually be paid for old devices. Um, so if you're looking for a great way to decommission all of those old machines, um, I was really, really impressed with the, the extent to which Dell goes to make sure that all of the parts of a PC that can be recycled and reused are, and then everything else is dis disposed of responsibly. So shout out to Dell. Uh, Rick, JR, thank you so much for joining me today. This has been fantastic. And I think this is probably something that resonates with a whole bunch of procurement people who are looking at all of the different endpoints. Thanks again for joining us for Modern Devices for Modern Cyber Threats. We'd like to thank Dell and AMD. I know we've learned a lot today, but if you'd like to learn more about how they improve fleet-wide security from the endpoint to the processor, you can scan the QR code on your screen for a report and learn more. This is Jackie McGuire for theCUBE. Thanks again.